You are listening to the API The Docs podcast. We are here to talk about API documentation upstream and downstream. But it ended up being for me like a really good indicator for what kind of company culture I wanted to work in. You know, I wanted to work for an organization that respected technical writers. Like I think the work we do is really important. I of course wanted to work somewhere that yeah, either even if they didn't have technical writers on their team, they would be open to acknowledging those skills and that experience. Leaving out words like simply or easily. Yeah. I mean, you've heard me say it a few times. It's still a bad habit. You know, trying to eliminate that from at least your documentation's vocabulary because they're words that are small, but if you're already in that state of frustration, they can be really harmful. The idea behind humanizing your documentation is really thinking about the user that is reading your documentation while you're writing it, which might sound like, ah, of course you're writing for an audience, but it's the idea of not only understanding like, okay, you're writing this for someone else to read, but the idea of what kind of mindset is that person going to be in while they're consuming your documentation. Hello and welcome to the API The Docs podcast. In this episode, your host is myself, Anet Pozsár. In my daytime job, I research and build developer portals at Pronovix. Our guest today is Caroline Stransky. Hello, Caroline. Hi. She is a journalist and software engineer, former technical writer, and she is also a conference speaker and workshop organizer. Is there something I missed? No, that, that pretty much covers everything. It's a a wide range. And what do you enjoy the most? That's a good question. I would definitely say writing in some capacity. It's the thing that is, I think, the most consistent out of everything I do, because even within software engineering or conference speaking, there is like that element of writing to it. You know, you need to mm -hmm. write your talk. You need to write documentation that goes with your code. You need to write code itself. So I think that just in general would be my favorite. And what kind of workshops do you organize? So I organize, well, this was pre-COVID. I haven't really organized <laughs> much since COVID. But the main workshop that I focus on organizing is called New Devs on the Block. Okay. And it is together with a developer named Nico Koenig. It is a free workshop for people who are interested in switching into technology and the tech industry and programming specifically. It's a two-day workshop. We teach them how to build a website and there's also talks and like a little bit of mentorship in between. We did one in Nuremberg in 2019 and we had one planned for Vienna last year, but unfortunately had to cancel. So we're hoping to get that started again once. So no online workshops? No, no. That is different, I Not guess. Apparently, Yeah. <laughs> Caroline, you started your career as a journalist and then you became a technical writer and now you are a software engineer slash frontender. I know technical writers come from such versatile backgrounds from tech or humanities, literature, journalism and so on. And I also heard a lot of stories about developers who write. Would you talk about the path you walked? Yeah, sure. Um, I agree with you also 100%. I think being involved in the technical writing community is really unique in the sense of you can't predict where anyone's background is from. Yeah, that's you true. Know? Like people come from all sorts of areas. And it's also the same way that you can't predict where anyone works, like what department. It's always a total guess. But yeah, my path has been a little bit like messy in the sense of, you know, here and there and back. So I'll give you an overview and we can dive into any part you find interesting. So I moved to Germany after my university. I studied journalism and I did a little bit of freelance journalism when I first moved. And then it wasn't really sustainable for an income, a visa, you know, kind of the standards yeah. to live. So I then got a job at a tech startup doing marketing. And so I stayed within the marketing realm for about two years. And I was doing a lot of forms of technical writing. I just didn't know it at the time that that was what it was. So I would write like, you know, these were 20 person startups. So I was the only writer there, I guess. So I would write documentation, but it would be like, ah, code snippet goes here, hand it to an engineer, and then they would figure it out. So I realize now looking back, like, oh, hmm, that's technical writing. <laughs> Didn't realize. 
And then I was working for a company that ultimately went bankrupt. And after that, I decided to take some time off and learn how to code. I went to a programming boot camp here in Berlin, then ended up in a technical writing position and then went to a front end position and then went back to technical writing momentarily last year for Google season of docs. And now I'm back in a front end position. So that's what I mean by kind of all over the place. Who I have a lot of questions. I don't know which direction we dive in. So can you tell us more about the Google season of docs? What was your role and how did it work? Yeah, of course. Google Season of Docs, um, just to give a quick overview, is a three to six month program that connects like experienced technical writers with an open source community. And then you're paid via Google or some sort of subsidiary of Google. Yeah, so I was accepted into the like 2020 cohort. I don't know exactly what term they use. I think it's cohort. Um, and I worked with the GraphQL Foundation. So the project that I proposed and ultimately worked on was creating a frequently asked questions resource for graphql.org. And yeah, so I ultimately ended up with that page doing all of the research, um, figuring out what questions were relevant to do. I think there's about 25 to 30 on there now. Um, writing all of the text or code snippets or anything that went in there, and as well as building out the actual page on the website. What's also nice about Google Season of Docs is because they want you to be really like immersed in the community. I spent a lot of time like triaging issues. I would review other pull requests that came into the documentation and just generally being involved with some of the working group meetings and everything that was going on. It was nice. I hadn't done a lot of open source work before that. So <laughs> that's nice. Do you have an advice? How should one start preparing uh, or putting together an FAQ page? Because for the first site, it is oh, just a bunch of questions, but it's really wow. So companies can save a lot of costs. It's really a lot of work. I think that's the thing. I mean, that's <laughs> not advice. That's just yeah. in my opinion. It's a fact. fact. <laughs> because I remember telling people like, oh, yeah, I'm going to spend like three months working on this FAQ page. And people were like, hmm, an <laughs> FAQ page, one page hmm, doesn't seem like a lot of work. And I was like, it is because yeah. I mean, if I had to give like one piece of advice, I would definitely say to figure out the overarching themes that you want to cover first. You know, do you want to have more like general introductory questions? Do you want to have like specific technical implementation details? Like what is the goal of the FAQ page? So for GraphQL, like a lot of the answers are more of an overview and then they link to specific parts of the documentation. So we do a lot of internal linking rather than, ah, here's a code snippet that you can use. Like we would much rather have people directed to different parts of the documentation and really be able to engage and go through that user flow rather than starting on the FAQ page and ending there. So always being able to provide like additional resources and things like that. Also, what we found really useful was going through a lot of other resources that we had. Like I scraped so many different websites. You know, I went through Reddit. I went through Quora. I had never even been on Quora before that. <laughs> and, you know, I went through our internal Slack. I went through Stack Overflow, of course, Twitter, anywhere that people might be asking questions to see also like that. I'm just throwing things out now. But one thing I would also suggest is if you're building an FAQ page, if you're a tool, talk to people who are like teaching it or talk to power users or talk to anyone like that, because they'll know, like they'll have direct experience with onboarding people to the technology and what kind of problems that they run into. Like those ended up being the most valuable. I really relied on people like Shruti Kapoor, like E. Purcello, like big teachers in the GraphQL community to help with that. And it is definitely more time that you would expect. <laughs> yes. Also building the page. Like I didn't realize that building the accordion feature where you click on a question and the answer shows up is actually pretty hard. <laughs> so I was not prepared at all for that. I was like, ah, it's a really frequent feature of websites. Like it must be like fairly straightforward to implement. And yeah, I was totally wrong because I also wanted to make it accessible. I wanted to make sure it was clean and all of that. <laughs> so yeah, it took a lot of time. <laughs> Going back to the beginning, um, is there a hard or soft skill that you learn as a journalist or a technical writer and you can use at your current position as a software engineer? 
Yes, like absolutely. I mean, besides general communication skills, because software engineering is so much of teamwork and communication, but like some specific ones is that being a technical writer really taught me to focus on how, like understanding how the software that I'm building is consumed. Like what are users really looking for? What is kind of the journey that they go through? Especially I work in the front end. So that kind of like user experience, user interaction, whether or not that is like explicitly part of my job is really important to consider. Not to mention that with the users and making sure that users can understand what we do. And of course, if you're writing any sort of documentation, making sure that that is clear, but also writing code that other people can understand you know, trying to create context within your code, uh, creating really readable, like variable names and things like that. I'm very aware of like the semantics of the code that I write in a way that I guess I can't say for sure, but in a way that I think I wouldn't have been if I hadn't been a technical writer in the past. And on the flip side, do you feel like you had to unlearn something or significantly change your approach as a software engineer? Yes. So, (laughs) yes. (laughs) So one of the things was deadlines with journalism, particularly, but also sometimes in technical writing or really writing in general, there's pretty set deadlines. This day, even this time is like when something needs to be done and published online. Yeah. And so I got really used to having that kind of deadline driven mindset. When I first became a software engineer, I kind of thought it was the same. And I was a little bit confused. We worked in an agile framework. So the idea of sprints like really stressed me out because I was like, okay, two weeks. Hmm. All right. I have like, you know, two or three tickets. All right. I need to have them done by the deadline, which I thought was, I think like the retrospective at the end of the sprint. I was like, I will have it done by then. And not ultimately realizing that with software engineering, things are a bit more mutable. Things can come up. There might be blockers that you're not aware of. There might be other requirements for the product that you just, there's no way that you could have known beforehand. And also that a lot of teams, including the team I was working on, do a lot of stretch goals during sprints. Stretch goals? Yeah. Like where you basically like take on more tickets than you probably think you might finish. Uh It's like, ah, it would be great if we could finish these, but if one out of three rolls over, not that big of a deal. I didn't realize that. I was like, I need to finish all these tickets. And it really (laughs) stressed me out for a long time. Until finally my team lead was like, hey, you seem stressed and you're working really late. What's going on here? And then we had a conversation about how you can't always control these things in software engineering. And sometimes things are a little bit more, of course, like if you have specific feature releases that need to be done or, you know, there's a big firefighting issue, then. Yeah, of course. (laughs) Of course, then that is more focused and deadline driven. But I think a lot of, at least for me, a majority of my work is not structured like that and that took a little bit of getting used to in hindsight was technical writing for you a transitional career between journalism and software engineering or is it something totally different but yeah after learning to code and becoming a technical writer i kind of realized all of the different areas that of software engineering that i didn't know and that i would have never learned unless i became one Mm -hmm. and so i think about things like really working collaboratively on a project, working really closely. I worked with like product owners as a technical writer, but I didn't quite know where documentation fit into the development workflow. I didn't really know how software engineers approached documentation in kind of a meaningful way. I mean, I could ask them and of course, like I could kind of observe them and see what they were doing. But I don't know. I thought that like, ah, if I become a software engineer, I will find these things out. And then if I do go back to technical writing, I will be better for it in that way. And that was kind of my approach for it. It doesn't mean that that's not to say not everyone needs to become a software engineer to be like a really proficient technical writer. But for me, it was really useful. And do you still have some kind of technical writing project? Not currently, but yeah, the Google season of docs thing was a perfect example. It was my chance to really, like I had the time, like I was in between positions and the opportunity was available and I was able to take it. And I did feel much more confident, like working on the GraphQL documentation than in my previous role as a technical writer. And I felt really self-sufficient in a way that I didn't previously. So I was able to understand the technology Mm -hmm. 
especially because it was a developer tool. Like I was able to understand it because I had used it as a developer. So that perspective really gave me new insight to that or being able to, as I mentioned, like build the actual page itself really like without a lot of assistance was really useful because then there weren't many blockers. I could make it whatever I wanted because I didn't need to like find someone to build it for me. It's really strange or funny. All these things are so intertwined. I mean, I know a lot of technical writers and also me that you have this tension that I'm I'm a technical writer, so I don't know the very technical things. So I can't totally deep dive, but I need to document it. But if I know all the facts and all the technical details, then I can't document it because of the curse of knowledge. And then I end up being a developer. So it just... Uh, yes, uh, the curse of knowledge is yeah. such a thing. It's... Yeah. And that's something also like going back to your question about, you know, things that technical writing helped me do was I spent a lot of time as a technical writer working with developers who were developing features and being like, okay, can you describe this feature to me? Ah, let's take a step back. Like, let's really start from the beginning of like, how do we move through this application? How do we do this? And having that kind of mindset helps me when I have to document things now. So being able to really, yeah, take that step back and be like, okay, if I've never seen this before, what will I do? But it's still really hard. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) If you're so deep in something, you're just, it's hard. Yeah. Sometimes the more you know, the harder to explain it. Exactly. Exactly. I'm just wondering why did you decide to become a developer? Because, um, and that's why I had these questions before, because I read your journey on LinkedIn and and it's kind of silly but in my head I imagine that okay you were a journalist and then a tech writer and then a software engineer so you are becoming more and more and more technical but maybe it's totally not the case yeah I mean you're not wrong it really did end up like that it wasn't intentional but it did end up exactly like that the blunt answer is like I became a developer because I wanted more money I wanted I wanted more money. I wanted a better visa. I wanted to also kind of what I mentioned earlier. I was like, oh, technical writing is such a good fusion. But I yeah had all these blockers as far as like how I understand the development workflow, how I understand the process. So I thought that like becoming a developer would help make me a better technical writer in the future, which mm-hmm. I still stand by. I do agree with that. But what I've also found is that there are a lot of engineering positions that do have documentation really like built into the role. So right now um, at my current company, I'm working on the team that's building the design system. I mean, we spend a decent amount of our time documenting like the components that we're building because, you know, we're supposed to be the service unit that is building these, you know, really small encapsulated modular components that all of the other teams are going to use. But the only way they're going to use them is if they understand how to use them, how they work, what accessibility considerations are there, et cetera. Yeah, we get to do that. We're even thinking about like within the next couple of quarters, like building our own documentation platform. <laughs> like I've been really fortunate in finding a role that I get to use those skills and still be like in engineering and kind of do that. So that's, I think, I can't say what I'm going to end up doing in the future, but I do kind of like sitting in this place where I get to use all of those skills meaningfully. Yeah. <laughs> So we know the why, but how did you make this transition? (laughs) So I had gone, as I mentioned, like to a coding boot camp before becoming a technical writer. That was like my introduction to code and what's going on with JavaScript, all of those things. So that was a big help, like having that kind of experience, having the projects, all of that. But as far as like once I was already in a technical writing role, switching from that to software engineering, First, I tried to move internally within my company, but I really wanted mentorship and there just wasn't a mentorship structure. And so then what I ended up doing was, I mean, essentially, I just applied for a bunch of jobs I wanted to see. But the thing is, is that what was interesting about switching from technical writing to a developer position, and I mean, I ended up switching to like more junior role. It was hard to find a role that respected my skills in that sense. I talked to a lot of companies that were like, ah, okay, it's your first development job. So, you know, 
really start from the bottom here. And I was like, yes, I like, I would be a lower level engineer. That was a fact. But like, realistically, I had all of these skills from technical writing. I had worked like embedded in an engineering team. I knew kind of, it wasn't the same in my opinion, as like coming straight out of a boot camp and having never worked in tech before. And it wasn't the same as like, ah, like I've never worked within a code base or something like that. But it ended up being for me, like a really good indicator for what kind of company culture I wanted to work in. You know, I wanted to work for an organization that respected technical writers. Like I think (laughs) the work we do is really important. And so I, of course, wanted to work somewhere that, yeah, either even if they didn't have technical writers on on their team, they would be open to acknowledging those like skills and that experience and seeing it as a really positive indicator for my work. And I still kind of do that because I do kind of flux between software engineering and technical writing a bit. It's really important to me in interviews. You know, if I bring it up, like people acknowledge it respectfully or they're able to kind of see what value that would bring beyond just like, ah, can you code like quickly and proficiently? It's good to see because I know that companies vary uh, in this matter. I mean, documentation culture. As you mentioned, uh, there are companies when developers write documentation and it is fully in the workflow and in the process of the definition of down. So I'm really happy to see that you gave presentations on this topic and about documentation. In the past few years, you gave several talks about accessibility-friendly documentation and humanizing your documentation. Can you talk a bit more? What does it mean, humanizing your documentation? Yeah, sure. So the idea behind like humanizing your documentation is really thinking about the user that is reading your documentation while you're writing it which might sound like, ah, of course you're writing for an audience, but it's the idea of like, not only understanding like, okay, you're writing this for someone else to read, but the idea of like, what kind of mindset is that person going to be in while they're consuming your documentation? I like to think a lot about how, you know, when most people read documentation, it's typically because they have like a problem that they can't solve, or they're really frustrated, or there's something blocking them and they need to figure out what they're doing and like how your tool or solution will help them. And if you think about it that way, then, you know, if you skip steps in the process because you think, ah, like this is so clear or you maybe write, I also consider like a lot of like validation and error handling to be like a form of documentation. And if like that isn't clear, then you're only going to frustrate people further. And so it's kind of acknowledging those emotions that they're going to be there and that perhaps you should cater your docs to that. That includes things like developing user journeys that don't skip any steps. They really start from the beginning and then people can kind of find where in the process they are in that moment. But also to things like leaving out words like simply or easily, just, I mean, you've heard me say it a few times, it's still a bad habit, but, (laughs) you know, trying to eliminate that from at least your documentation's vocabulary, because they're words that are small, but if you're already in that state of frustration, they can be really harmful. And frankly, it doesn't really reflect well on your documentation. Like people aren't going to be like, ah, yes. And people love to like talk about bad documentation. So you don't want to like end up in that cycle. That's how I see it. I mean, there's probably a lot of other definitions, but yeah, like we're all humans and we're not writing documentation for computers. We're writing for humans. And as far as I understood, it is not necessarily a huge effort or huge thing. It is sometimes about leaving words. Exactly. It's, there are so many small things that you can do. And a lot of it is what we talked about earlier, like being able to acknowledge the curse of knowledge and being able to take that step back and think about, you know, yeah, who's going to be reading it? What mindset are they in? What knowledge might they have? Or another really great example of like what I consider more like humanized documentation is when you introduce a concept, even if it's something that you think people will already know, if you link to that documentation or maybe another part of your documentation that is like an introductory level explanation of it, I found that that really helps users because if they don't know that particular tool or that particular concept within your product, then they can go, you know, go read the intro and then come back and feel, you know, more informed and more like powerful in that way. 
So that's the same way I also really recommend like adding prerequisites to tutorials because it's a small step. It's, you know, it's it a, is, tiny, yeah. a tiny list and being able to just provide that and be like, hey, it'll help you if you know these things. Then people can kind of gauge like, how long will this tutorial take me? What else do I need to know? It also helps beginners being like, okay, if I'm working in this space, what are the skills that I need? There's a lot of benefits to it. And it, and yeah, in my opinion, doesn't take that much more effort if you're already writing it. Is accessible documentation still close to your heart? And where does uh, accessible friend documentation and humanized documentation overlaps? Yes. So... I'd say it is. I mean, really in the same way that building any sort of accessible experience is to me really. Like as a front-end engineer, I really take that on as like my responsibility to make sure that everything I build and ship is available for everyone. And that could also include documentation. So as I mentioned, I work on the design systems team and we do all of our components are accessible, or at least they definitely should be. If they're not, that's a problem. And the goal, for example, with this documentation platform that we might be building is that we want like a huge focus is going to be consuming our own components. So using the components that we build, which should be accessible to create the documentation. So the idea is that, of course, that's like some sort of dog fooding. We're testing our own product, but we're also making sure that the experience is available. And as far as overlapping, I think it really is. I think it's almost like a like the Venn diagram is a circle. Like I think it's a complete overlap in the sense of it's incredibly frustrating if you're a user and you need to use some sort of assistive technology or you know you have some sort of visual impairment or hearing impairment and you can't use a website. Like the website is not built in a way that you should like you are able to use it. That's incredibly frustrating. It's almost like dehumanizing in a lot of ways. Especially because I don't know, the way I think about it is like when that happens, like you know that there were engineers who built this who could have made it accessible. So I have a lot of like hard opinions on that. And especially when there's so many tools now that, you know, you can put in accessibility tests to make sure they pass. If you're using a Mac computer, like there is a screen reader built into it. So yeah. being able to use voiceover. Yeah, there are a lot of resources available out there. And I think making sure that the web is for everyone is inherently like humanizing. Did the last year, I mean, Corona times, uh, significantly challenge or change where we put the minimum bar for accessible and humanized documentation? Is there a connection you see? This is interesting. I don't know. I'll be very honest. I don't know. I mean, I think in general, this past year in Corona times made people just kind of more aware of like these emotional states. So like the mm -hmm. fact that like, we bring our emotions to work. We bring like, you know, the stress and realities of the outside world is something that we carry with us when we like log on to our computers. I think people are more aware of that. I don't know if there's necessarily like a correlation between that and documentation quite yet, but I think in general, people are a little bit more sensitive to how other people are feeling, or at least I hope so. I think so. In the beginning, you mentioned that writing is the most interesting task for you still. I'm just wondering that you gained a lot of knowledge and experience in the field of journalism and technical writing and software engineering, but where do you shine the most? What the most interesting for you or challenging on adventurous? I think I will always hold a place in my heart for journalism. I think it'll always be something like now I'm working in a software engineering role full time, but I still write like I freelance write in my free time. When I can find free time, I do it. And I think that to me will always be like the most, yeah, close to my heart, maybe the most interesting because it, journalism has this way of being kind of whatever you want it to be. There's so many different forms of journalism. There's so many different niches and outlets, that, especially with the internet. There's so many different platforms you can write for. And so I can, for example, go down a more technical route. Like I can really fuse journalism with software engineering. I can fuse journalism and technical writing. A lot of technical writing you know, if you're writing for different outlets and magazines can sometimes overlap and be journalism and vice versa. So I think for me, that kind of like dynamic nature of it 
is really appealing. And I think it'll just be something that even if I stop coding at some point, I will continue to explore these topics through journalism and writing. And this is our last question. Do you have a message you would like to leave the listeners with? Ooh, yeah. I think, you know, if we're talking about career journeys and kind of going back and forth through all these different fields and interests, I mean, my biggest thing I'd want to leave people with is like, if you want something and you're able to like, you know, you're in a place of stability or, you know, financially, whatever, and you're able to go for it, I say do it. I mean, some people, I've gotten into this argument about like, because my CV looks like, you know, people say it looks disjointed or it kind of goes all over the place and it looks a little messy. But realistically, like, it's a journey that I am very proud of taking. And it's a journey that I think with every role that I've had, I've come closer and closer to realizing kind of like what I'm passionate about, what I want. What do I want to spend 40 hours a week doing? Like, it's a lot of time. If you're unhappy in whatever position it may be, whether you're a technical writer, you're a software engineer, or you think there's something that could be a better fit and you can find it, I say go for it. Thank you, Caroline, and thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. It was really nice. Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. Thanks again to our guest, to Pronovix, for letting us work on this and the entire API The Docs community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website apidocs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API The Docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well.